Thank you very much, uh, Tony, and, and thank you for your very kind words. It, it's always a pleasure to be here uh, at the Institute uh, and to see many uh, friendly faces uh, from my work uh, in the past, uh, both uh, with the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs during the Irish Chairmanship of the OCE, uh, as well as when I was in the work in the EU and the many contacts I had with, with friends from, from Ireland. Uh, <coughs> when um, the uh, SEPS had its annual conference uh, earlier this year, one of the themes uh, of uh, the, one of the sessions was does Europe matter? Uh, interesting, intriguing question, but very relevant, uh, bearing in mind uh, the current criticisms uh, of the EU as a whole and the EU project. The general response uh, at the conference was, yes, Europe still matters, but we need to work much harder to demonstrate that it really matters uh, and that the uh, success of the European integration project has really been one which has been uh, very uh, significant and positive for the citizens uh, of the European Union. I guess the same debate uh, would be relevant for the enlargement uh, agenda of the European Union. Uh, there is no doubt uh, that, um, unfortunately, despite the many successes of the enlargement uh, policy uh, over the past uh, decades, uh, uh, there is really uh, an enormous amount of criticism uh, directed against the enlargement policy and probably uh, the most vocal criticism was during the last European Parliament elections when uh, the loudest voices uh, were of course the populist parties uh, who equated uh, more enlargement with more immigration and who generally were very um, dismissive of the enlargement agenda for, for the European uh, Union. Uh, and it's unfortunate, uh, it's a reality nevertheless, that uh, the enlargement agenda of the European Union has become victim of the very toxic debate on immigration in uh, several of the EU member countries, not least uh, in the UK. Of course, uh, other issues which weaken uh, the European Union's commitment towards enlargement or the perception of that uh, weakening is the um, fallout from the financial crisis. Uh, also, uh, several who still feel that perhaps Romania and Bulgaria came in too early, etc., etc. But certainly, whatever about the reasons, uh, it is very worrying to see uh, that the whole enlargement agenda of the European Union is being questioned. And the uh, statement by the new President of the European Commission, uh, Mr. Juncker, in July, which he repeated in September, that uh, there will be no new enlargement uh, in the next, within his mandate, within the next five years, was most unhelpful even if, of course, technically uh, he is correct in that none of the countries currently negotiating, uh, Montenegro, Serbia or Turkey, are anywhere near uh, accession. But to say that so bluntly uh, sent the, very, uh, the worst possible message, uh, for, uh, particularly for the citizens of the Western Balkans, who still see the uh, accession to the European Union as the key objective. Um, and so uh, it was uh, really uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, who managed to redress the situation by hosting a summit of the Western Balkan leaders in August, uh, last August, uh, where she um, used the opportunity to remind, of course, the Western Balkans of their uh, responsibilities in terms of the reforms that they must implement in order to come closer to the European Union and for accession negotiations, but also uh, she used it as a reminder to the EU uh, of the European Union's commitment uh, to the, uh, in particular, Western Balkan countries, uh, a commitment which had been expressed very clearly in the summit which took place in Thessaloniki in 2003 under the Greek presidency at the time, that the future of the Balkans lies in the European Union, a very, very clear uh, political commitment uh, for uh, the Balkan countries. 
So uh, that uh, summit of Chancellor Merkel, which actually, uh, when we, I was asking people from the uh, Chancellor and Foreign Ministry, uh, th- the initiative came out of uh, how can we uh, commemorate 100 years uh, since the First World War. And if you look at the communique of that uh, summit meeting in Berlin at the end of August, you will see that there are uh, events that are planned for the next four years, in other words, the the, uh, four years of the uh, First World War. Whatever uh, the background, it was a very, very useful initiative. Uh, And uh, also it uh, was uh, very helpful in reminding the European Union that it would be a grave mistake to turn its back uh, on the Western Balkan countries. To do so would (coughs) certainly fuel the agenda of the nationalists, and there are still quite vocal groups of nationalist elements uh, in different countries of the Western Balkans. It would also uh, be very uh, useful for the, what you might call the the elites, the oligarchs, the criminal groups who uh, profit from the status quo. Uh, Many refer to them as the gatekeeper elites who are there and who know that uh, the closer their countries come into the European Union, the more difficult it will be for them to continue with their unlawful uh, activities with porous borders, etc., etc. So all of these vested interests uh, would uh, be served by the EU uh, reducing its commitment to the Balkans or turning its back uh, on the Balkans. And there's another important factor, is that uh, the European Union is not the only player in the Western Balkans. Russia has become much more assertive in its foreign policy, as we know from the Ukraine uh, situation. Uh, And uh, it is using that foreign policy uh, assertiveness to make its presence felt in a much more vocal way in the last months uh, in the Balkan countries. Witness the uh, visit of uh, President Putin to Belgrade uh, a few weeks ago, uh, where uh, the opportunity was used to highlight the very strong, uh, certainly very strong, cultural, historic links uh, between uh, the uh, Slavic world, between Serbia in particular, uh, and Russia. And while this is all very good, but we know that behind all of that there are clear ulterior motives and of course there are energy interests which are at play. So the European Union needs to understand that now uh, it is not the only player uh, in the Balkans. So another reason why the European Union needs really to maintain the focus on the Western Balkans is the major efforts that are still required for reforms. Uh, And the last uh, progress reports from the European Commission highlighted very clearly uh, what uh, is uh, still required and the problems which still exist, uh, which affect the uh, governance, uh, as a generic word, governance in all of these countries. Just some examples, uh, the fact that there is a lack of political dialogue, regular dialogue between Uh, political parties in different countries, which weakens parliamentary institutions. There are now boycotts of parliament uh, still uh, underway uh, in Macedonia, in Albania. Uh, And uh, this is also highlighting uh, the critical problem of uh, proper governance. There's also continued political interference in the judiciary, a selective approach to judicial processes. Corruption at many levels uh, of government, uh, which has remained still endemic, like a a cancerous growth uh, in society in these countries. And perhaps more alarming of all, uh, to uh, and which was highlighted in the progress report, was the uh, continuing and worsening uh, attacks on the media, uh, where uh, they are subject to harassment, imprisonment, violence, uh, and of course every effort to ensure that independent media is marginalized uh, completely. And linked to that, of course, is the marginalization of civil society. Uh, And uh, I've always felt that uh, the EU should have been much more cognizant of the critical role that civil society could play, particularly in transition 
uh, communities, post-conflict societies, and virtually all the Balkan countries are post-conflict societies, uh, and where uh, very often it is civil society that can manage to fill the gap when there is a lack of trust between the government elites and the citizens. So, <clears throat> of course, uh, as the progress reports uh, highlighted, the situation uh, is worse in some countries than others. Uh, and certainly the two countries which come out with the worst scorecards are, once again, unfortunately, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Macedonia. And, uh, of course, the reason for that lies mainly with the countries themselves, a lack of political will uh, and a refusal to uh, recognize the importance of the reforms which are there not because the EU says they must be implemented, but they are there precisely to help the countries uh, move from uh, the past uh, system into a more democratic uh, market-led uh, um, sit uh, economic situation and more democratic uh, institutions. But I also feel that the EU uh, must share uh, some of the blame uh, for uh, the bleak picture that we have in the Balkan countries. The EU has at times lacked consistency in its progress reports. For example, one year it would highlight the importance of political dialogue, the next year it would ignore it virtually or only make a passing reference to it. As if there was uh, the element of political expediency uh, to uh, overtake the more objective criteria of assessing the real situation. And of course, uh, the EU's commitment uh, and weakening of that commitment is also to blame because it means that their EU leverage is much uh, less uh, than it was. So what, what is the, the way forward? Well, certainly uh, the first element is that the EU needs to reinforce uh, and reconfirm in a very vigorous way its determination for enlargement, for the accession uh, of, uh, in particular, the Western Balkan countries. I'll, I'll mention Turkey uh, separately a bit, bit later. There needs to be a much more consistent approach in the assessment by the Commission of the uh, situation in each of the countries and also a much more prescriptive approach uh, when there was the visa liberalization debate, uh, each of the countries in the Balkans were given a list of reforms, border management, security of documentation, etc., that they had to fulfill. Very, very detailed roadmaps. And they all achieved that. And visa liberalization was granted to virtually all of the Balkan countries and played a major role in uh, strengthening the links between the citizens, the students of the Balkans and the European Union. This is the approach that uh, should be uh, used much more systematically across the board. Uh, the, the Commission has um, promoted a, a correct approach in terms of highlighting the fundamental reforms as a priority, rule of law, economic governance and public administration. But again, uh, unfortunately, it becomes too much of a technocratic exercise, ticking the boxes when a legislation has been adopted by a given parliament. That's not enough because very often legislation, for example, on anti-discrimination, uh, protection of minorities, uh, is adopted, fine, but then it's not implemented because of a lack of financial resources, of a lack of proper consultation of civil society. So these... Uh, criteria should be incorporated uh, and should be checked by the European Union before a law could be deemed uh, to be accepted. And also I would uh, suggest, uh, and I put it in some of the recommendations of, of the policy paper uh, that we, we published a few weeks ago, that on the media the EU needs to be much more uh, vocal, much more proactive it makes no sense that the OSC freedom of the media representative uh, speaks out very strongly on media violation, violation against media freedom, but that the EU remains uh, very quiet or, or even silent. So there needs to be a much more proactive approach uh, and there should be greater support of investigative reporting as a way of uh, checking uh, government uh, and the activities of government. And also, in the same context, the EU needs to be much more supportive 
in a more systematic way of civil society, providing uh, in, uh, support for them, financial support, also um, technical assistance, because as I mentioned earlier, civil society often are the link between the citizens and fill the gap when governments uh, are not fulfilling their uh, promises. And also, a, a strong civil society ensures greater accountability uh, by the government's concern because they act uh, as, uh, as a watchdog. And uh, finally, there needs to be a much more uh, systematic pressure for political dialogue. Unfortunately, in these countries, uh, picking up the phone to talk to your political opponents is not something which is automatic. And I remember during my last years in Macedonia, almost all my time was spent trying to convince the government of the day, which is still in power now since 2006, to pick up the phone and invite the opposition leaders for talks. And usually it always ended up that we, I would have to host a meeting of the political leaders of the parties because otherwise they would not meet. And this again really needs to, to change uh, and there I think the European Parliament can play an important role in uh, offering, and it's something I, I mentioned at the um, Eroctus um, EU Affairs Committee two weeks ago when I presented the paper, that um, support for the youth branches, bringing the youth branches of political parties from uh, these uh, the Balkan countries from Serbia, Macedonia, Albania, etc., to EU uh, countries, to the European Parliament, to see how a uh, political dialogue is is undertaken and, and so forth. So, very briefly, just a few points on each of the countries: Montenegro and Serbia are negotiations are underway. Uh, the 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 train is is moving along uh, slowly, but nevertheless there is a dynamic process there which is in place. And that's the great advantage of a negotiation process, is that it gives the EU much greater powers of scrutiny over the activities uh, of the governments uh, concerned. Albania <coughs> received candidate status in June, and now they will have to work hard on reforms, and they're doing relatively well according to uh, the progress reports in order to move to the next stage uh, of the process, which would be the Commission recommending a, a date be set for opening negotiations. Macedonia and Bosnia and Herzegovina are uh, in a very, very difficult situation uh, for Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, as the reports say, uh, the accession process is at a standstill. And I think that there really needs to be a major initiative of the EU to de-block the situation. Bosnia and Herzegovina is a dysfunctional government system, unfortunately, uh, and uh, if the EU was able to achieve success in the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue, there's not no reason why it could not uh, undertake a similar effort uh, for Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in one of our uh, policy papers, we suggested that there needs to be some sort of constitutional a conference um, could be along the lines of the Irish Constitutional Convention, where you bring in all the different actors in order to try and move the, the process forward. And the High Representative Mogherini has already uh, admitted that there needs to be uh, some uh, determined action there. And for Macedonia, apart from uh, the issue of the uh, very serious uh, backsliding in many of the reforms, an increasing authoritarian uh, uh, government uh, actions uh, which are affecting the citizens in a very negative way, uh, there is the, the name, the bilateral dispute of the name. Uh, and um, it clearly uh, this cannot go on. For 19 years, uh, the uh, mediation process of the UN uh, has been ongoing uh, in, uh, between Macedonia and Greece, but has produced no results. There needs to be some de-blocking of that, just as the bilateral uh, issues, um, disputes between uh, Cyprus and Turkey. There needs to be some de-blocking there in order to uh, try to move forward. And, and on Turkey, I would just like to say that, unfortunately, the accession process is not stalled, but it's not going very far. 
uh, and the Commission has proposed on several occasions, rightly so, that we should try to reactivate the negotiations, open in some key areas like rule of law, and that, that would give a, a greater uh, possibility for uh, the European Union to impact on the uh, internal process in Turkey. But mm -hmm. I doubt very much that will happen. The only uh, opening perhaps would be uh, the Commission's proposal that there will be an increased foreign policy dialogue with the candidate <coughs> countries. Uh, and certainly with Turkey, uh, because it's at a critical uh, place, position there in the, um, in the region, uh, there could be a lot uh, to be gained with, as a compensation for the fact that the negotiations are not moving very far. The policy, foreign policy dialogue with Serbia would also be very useful, uh, a strengthened foreign policy dialogue, uh, bearing in mind the earlier issue I mentioned of uh, Serbia's uh, relationship with Russia, but also because Serbia on the 1st of January will assume the chairmanship of the OSCE, which will give it uh, an international uh, high-profile pro platform uh, where uh, its approach will be critical. It cannot sit on the fence. It has to take very clear stands on the rule of law uh, and on the importance of the international community and the members of the OSCE to respect uh, the, the uh, rule of law. Kosovo, uh, finally, uh, a stabilization association agreement was initialed, the first stage towards this accession process. A very significant when you consider that uh, where uh, the, the starting point, uh, and it's one of the results of the uh, nor normalization process between Serbia and Kosovo. But there they're going through difficulties of uh, trying to form a, a government which again emphasizes the, 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 the weak political institutions that undermine uh, progress in that uh, and the broader region. So in conclusion I, I really would uh, emphasize that uh, the European Commission has a, a major task ahead of it together with the High Representative in trying to demonstrate uh, that the transformative power, as we call it, of the European Union still works, that it can achieve change in its nearest neighbourhood, that it confirms its commitment uh, to the, in particular, the Western Balkan countries. Turkey, again, is a separate case, a special case, I, I should say, because we know there is a lot of unease within the EU member countries but nevertheless, a negotiation process is in place and the EU must respect its commitment in that respect. So, um, but at the same time, I think the European Union as a whole, and it's not just the European Commission, needs to understand that allowing double standards uh, to occur within the European Union, such as tolerating attacks on media and civil society, as has been happening in Hungary, uh, is only undermining uh, the credibility of the European Union and is weakening the EU leverage because it's very easy for them to say, for the country to say, well, look at Hungary, look at the UK that wants to leave the European Convention of Human Rights. Why can't we do that? So it really comes down to a question of what kind of Europe do we want? Uh, and uh, do we want to uh, reaffirm the values on which the European Union is placed? Uh, do we want to allow countries uh, like Hungary and those to undermine those values? It doesn't, it's not right that it is Norway and the US that are not in the EU that speak out against this. Norway because many of the civil society organizations receiving funds from Norway were uh, the subject of intimidation and, and criticism uh, and visits of inspectors from the Hungarian government. The EU must also speak out on these uh, attacks uh, within the European Union. There needs to be a, a, a very clear uh, determination to address these uh, issues. And on that uh, challenging note, I end my introduction. Thank you very much.